Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Global Compliance Panel's live webinar on DHF, DMR, DHR, and TF, Regulatory Documents Explained. My name is Johnson, and I'm going to be a host for today's session. On behalf of the Global Compliance Panel team, I'd like to thank you for being a part of today's event. Today's webinar will be presented by Mr. Jeff Kessoff. Mr. Kassoff is the Director of Quality at Barn Medical, a leading manufacturer of endoscopy and colonoscopy devices, where he oversees the operations of quality systems. In this position, Jeff is responsible for oversight of document control system, including maintenance of regulatory documentation. Prior to this, Jeff has spent 13 years at Life Tech Inc., as a Director of Regulatory Affairs, where he was responsible for compliance of the corporate quality system. Jeff received his Regulatory Affairs certification in 1996. We are honored to have such a distinguished person such as Jeff with us to present the webinar. Before we begin, I would like to inform you of the program outline for today's training session. The webinar is for 60 minutes duration. First, Jeff will take you through today's webinar highlighting the areas that would be covered and he would then share with you his presentation. We would like to inform all our participants once part of the teleconference have been placed on mute and will remain so until the Q&A begins towards the end of the webinar. Now this is done so that any kind of discontinuity is avoided and this presenter can speak clearly so that everyone can take maximum benefit from this webinar. We also request all to hold back your questions until the Q&A window begins. Ten minutes of time will be allotted for the Q&A, during which your questions will be answered. If for any reason you do get logged out of this training session or teleconference, please follow the same procedure to join in again. Now that we are ready to start, I request Jeff to take it from here. Jeff? Th thank you so much for the introduction. Let me welcome everybody to this webinar. <clears throat> For those of you who have not attended webinars before, I really think that the only downside, the only detriment you're going to find is that I can't see you and, and you can't see me. The way I like to address that is at the end of the webinar, certainly we'll have a Q&A session, but if you want to treat that as more of a discussion, a give and take kind of thing, I'm more than happy to do that. Whatever, uh, you know, you guys are the paying customers, so whatever you want, whatever will uh, work for you. Today's webinar, as it says, it's, it's really all about documentation and how to make sure that you document accurately document the current status of your quality system, the current status of your products, and the current status of the, your products design and your related processes. There's a lot to this when it comes to documentation. And when we say documentation, what I want everybody to remember is that it's okay for a, any of this to be electronic. Long gone are the days where we had uh, books and books and binders and binders of uh, device master records and device history records and, and things like that. It's okay to scan documentation and have it be virtual, even outside. I'm not talking about electronic signatures here. I'm talking about taking <clears throat> pieces of paper, taking, for example, your DHR, which is the record of your assembly, and scanning those doc pages that have been hand-signed and putting them into directory and using that to illustrate your compliance. I want to begin right away, just jump right into it with the, with the DHF, the design history file. From a regulatory perspective, the definition is just that it's a, it's a compilation of records that describe the design history of your device. That's a very open-ended thing, but luckily there are additional requirements that we can use to determine what needs to be in our DHF. 82030J of the regulations, this is 21 CFR, for those of you who need a little clarification, require that the DHF be established and maintained for each type of device. So established means that you have to have a system in place that imposes requirements on you to, uh, to put your DHF together. Maintained means the concept of maintenance implies a little more than implies, it's a little more explicit, an ongoing maintenance of this document. Things that have to be maintained have to be done periodically. They don't just have to be set in stone and then not modified. So remember, your DHF is going to be a fluid document. Your DHF has to contain or reference records that show that your design excuse me, was developed 
now it can contain the records. It can be those records. You can have a DHF that is an enormous electronic file or and or a, uh, a binder of documents. Uh, if you don't have that, you can reference the location of these documents in a significantly smaller electronic file or binder. <clears throat> Containing is more straightforward because when, in order to prove that you've doc that you've uh, designed your product in accordance with specifications, it's easier to have everything at your disposal. There are many regulations and, and quite a few webinars that I present that deal equally with regulations, because we're dealing with RQE here, but to a great extent, equally with biz, good business practices, things like change control, where you want to meet the regulations, but you want to streamline the process. For the most part, regulatory documents are what they are. There's a list of requirements that are either imposed by regulation or by your internal processes that you have to keep. So this is a very strict regulatory presentation for that reason. Just wanted to go on the side there. When you have these records that you've got to reference or contain, you've got to show two things. You've got to demonstrate that your design was developed according to the regulations and according to your own internal design plan. So you're going to make sure that you have a requirements document, most people call it an SOP, that lists what needs to be in your design plan. And you need to make sure that those that, that document Im, uh, imposes the same requirements as the QSR regs. It can certainly impose additional requirements. I don't know why you would want to do that, but there's nothing violative about that. Uh, when it comes to the international regs, 9001 and 1345, there's no requirement for the DHF. Now, there is a TF, a technical file requirement, which overlaps the DHF to a great extent, but we'll cover that later in the presentation. The rationale for having a DHF is, in, in my mind, it's very interesting. The DHF is a compilation of records that show that you've got to meet the, that show that you do meet the design control regulations. One of the best things about the design control regulations is that each, each section of the DHF has its own section of in the QSR. So you can really, while the, ex, while the requirements are deliberately not as explicit as they could be, because the drafters of the regs didn't want to impose any uh, industry-specific or any model-specific um, requirements upon us, they did want to make sure that we understand the need for documenting things at the risk of talking trash about engineers, engineer, I'm not an engineer, and in my opinion, engineers have, you know, bodies of knowledge that I can never aspire to, but part of the body of knowledge that they have often does not include good or I'll say compliant documentation practices. So we have to make sure that we don't curtail the design process of these engineers by requiring them to do unnecessary documentation. Many firms have uh, project managers or some sort of uh, engineering technicians or associates that, to a large extent, follow the engineers around and write down what happens. Obviously, the engineers are assist in that process, but that's something that you want to be careful when you start to uh, establish and maintain your DHF, which is going to be, depending on the product, of course, a extremely large document that you don't impair the ability of the engineers, the design engineers, that is, to actually do what, what their bread and butter is, which is design. There's no requirement as far as where you keep the DHF and how you organize it. What I recommend, based on my experience, is that when it comes to simple designs, that the designer can assemble and also then there, later on maintain the entire DHF. It's not going to be a very large one, a very intricate one. But when it comes to larger projects, what I recommend you do is establish your document control system. Well, you know what? You already have a document control system, but you utilize it for your design documents, and you maintain these files in a central location. One of the reasons for this would be that for a larger project, a more inclusive project, there's a reasonable chance that 
that project is very large and extensive and and more so possibly in your company's wheelhouse than smaller projects that you may utilize design information from that larger project for d further designing of other products. The more that type of thing is, is under the document control system, the easier it is for document control to organize it and maintain it and supply it for further projects for, to, the, uh, to the engineers. Le where I want to begin now <laughs> is to talk about the contents of your DHF. There are quite a few documents in your DHF. <laughs> the first thing, first thing you start with, and let me apologize for one thing in advance. This is an hour, an hour and change long webinar. There are in-person seminars that last several days that cover each one of these topics, the DHF and the DMR and things like that. So while I'm giving you an abbreviated explanation here, there's many more details that you, you may want to uh, further educate yourself on. But as long as you sort of maintain this table of contents, if you will, and you're familiar with what needs to be, for example, in the approved design input documentation. Well, it's going to be, excuse me, excuse me, it's going to be the design input requirements which state what it is that the product needs to be, and that documentation needs to be approved before you begin a process, as you begin your process, of your design process, you want to make sure that you completely understand all of the requirements that you need to maintain. Requirements, not just customer requirements, but internal requirements. For example, uh, many, many firms choose to have a requirement from a materials perspective that they want to try to, they want to strive to use current pr materials or current processes. Uh, manufacturing engineering may impose a use of current processes, processes, but also current manufacturing equipment type of thing. So all of your design input documentation is the first section of your DHF. This is followed by the design output documentation, which succinctly put, shows that your inputs are met. And many companies use a matrix of here are our inputs, and this next column is the here are our outputs to show that we've met them. And then he, the third column is evidence that we've met those outputs. Uh, evidence might be, for example, a design specification document or a manufacturing procedure that does specifically reference utilization of existing manufacturing equipment. Also in the DHF has to be the design and development plans. Make sure when you put your plans together, and these are usually Gantt charts, project plans, uh, Microsoft projects, things like that that you include in these plans each individual design task that is include, including design reviews and the deliverable for each of these tasks. You've got to make sure that you have both of those things in each of your plans. And your plan is going to evolve as the, as the uh, process itself evolves. So you'll have multiple design development plans in your DHF. The FDA will expect to see multiple project plans because if they don't, you haven't fully captured your entire design project. And then the results of the design validation. Uh, how do you know that the, the product you've made, that the product made using these design outputs meets the design validation, validation requirements, that it needs to be able to fit on a particular uh, piece of equipment if you make a consumable, or if you make one part that's part of a system, how you know that that part that you make does fit and can be utilized with that system. As I mentioned a moment ago, every design review has to be documented, whether it's a uh, major design review, which is a phase review usually, or an interim design review, which is usually used for things like source code. If there's source code that needs to be written for your design, for your uh, for your project, it's not necessary to have the entire group in to review that documentation. You only need to have a, a an interim design review, <clears throat> but every design review has to be documented. There's a second bullet point there that I uh, apologize that that's there. Uh, the next <clears throat> the next thing that has to be in your DHF is all of the control design documents and the change control records. You're at the point in your design process now where you know that 
this product works as made. What you need to do now <clears throat> is make sure that all the documentation has been prepared. Uh, specifications, drawings, procedures, quality assurance uh, procedures or drawings, whichever you use. Even things like equipment maintenance, if it's a new piece of equipment, calibration schedules, things like that all have to be maintained or referenced in your DHF. When I mentioned earlier that it's usually easier or more straightforward to include as opposed to reference uh, certain sections in your DHF, this is one where it's more the exception and the rule. When it comes to referencing things like change control records, you have a document control process in place at your company. And that document control process is one that exists outside of your design process and enables you to be able to say, for example, that our ECN, Engineering Change Notification, <clears throat> number uh, 3148 implemented this new design, this product, or this new product with this new design, obviously. I can have a copy of that ECN in my DHF, which lists the revisions of all the attached documents, and therefore I've, therefore, I've been able to reference the location of the change control records. A question that you need to ask yourself when it comes to the DHF is, when I make changes to my design inputs, do I need to make changes to the DHF? An example is often, uh, this comes across more often than not in with regard to complaint investigations. You receive a complaint, and what you determine in that complaint is that the reported occurrence has never been accounted for during your risk assessment, during your risk management process. When that happens and you begin to try to have systems in place, to implement systems to address that risk, to mitigate that risk, that what you may see is that you, you need to add a design input because now you have a new requirement that the component, for example, be of a particular length because now my plastic component is so long that it's being exposed to force and snapping. So now I have a new design input requirement that the length of that plastic part be shorter than a certain dimension. So now I have a design input requirement do I need to change the DHF? The answer is almost always yes. You do need to change the DHF. Many firms have their design input documentation as well as their design output documentation, but more so the design input docs as under rev numeric, rev control. And that way we have version one when we first generate the design input documentation. But even well before this in the process, even during my design, design output determinations, I realize that I've omitted some design inputs. Now I'm going to rev bump that design input documentation to rev2, and so on and so forth. So when I get to the example we're on now, as far as whether we make changes to the, to the design inputs in response to complaints, I can up rev that input documentation again to rev3, and I may very well have to up rev my design output documentation to its additional rev to show that I met my new requirement. I'm going to move now to the DMR, the device master records. The, the DMR itself is how you build the product. Uh, you often hear the DMR referenced as the re it's the recipe. It's a little more than just the recipe, because to me a recipe is how you do something. But what sometimes what's not in the recipe, well, I, don't, I don't want to debate uh, cooking, for example, but the, the DMR is not just the recipe, it's the shopping list. It's the recipe and the instructions. Any diagrams or drawings that are in place, those are also included in the DMR. The DMR contents, most firms organize their DMRs, their device master records, by product line, product family, as opposed to making an individual DMR for each device. You can go either way, whichever you choose, depending on the similarity between various products in your product line. You may realize that you know there's enough different components, for example, that I do need to do on a DMR for each, uh, each device. You may determine, well, you know what? The only difference here is that my catheters are all of the same material but and all the same length, but they're uh, 6 French, 9 French, and 12 French. Well, that's, that's a good example of some time, an example where you may, you know, decide that one 
DMR for product family will work. If you do that, you want to make sure to include all of the model numbers in your DMR. Then you're going to have a product description. I haven't seen this everywhere that I've been, just uh, full disclosure. I've seen it in enough DMRs that I kind of like it. I think it's very useful, although it's more product specification related and less DMR related. I kind of like it, and I feel that when I present webinars, I like to base a lot of my recommendations or even suggestions on my own experience. So to that point, I've seen product description in, uh, in DMRs, not all of them but some of them, and that's entirely up to you whether you want to include application and intended use in your DMR. Uh, revision history, the DMR itself is going to be rev controlled, and we'll talk in a few moments that the list of parts on the DMR, each of those will not have a rev, rev level on it. So if my DMR for a particular widget is at rev level A and I add a new part, I'm going to uprev my DMR to Rev B. I like to see DMRs that have uh, description blocks, change, uh, history, uh, design history blocks on the top or bottom of them, because it really let, gives you a handle on what's changed over time. It's an easier way to do it than to look at the ECO number or ECN number that's on that page, go to the ECO, see what's changed, go to the red line document within that ECO that made that change, so now I can completely understand it when I have a change control block on my DMR and my other documents as well. I can look at the history easily and briefly and see what's changed. This is incredibly helpful for things like complaint investigations or trend-based, in-process in trend-based investigations. Your DMR should have a shelf life. If you have a shelf life of a sterile consumable, for example, you've got to have a shelf life on it. Not so much use life, recommended use life, if for an instrument, just a regulatory required shelf life. Quantity of units and shipment configuration. Many companies that sell sterile consumables sell 10 for a shipboard carton, and then they take five cartons of 10 and put them in a shipping box. So you've got to make sure to account for that shipment configuration in your DMR. All the documents should be listed on your DMR, as I mentioned earlier, just by document number and description, if you like, but not the current revision of the part. Because each document itself does have a current rev level and history of its own outside of the DMR, so you can track its history that way. The bill of materials should have uh, should be on there, the, the list of parts, um, including subassemblies. So indented, things like indented bills and materials should be on there as well. Each of the components should be on there by part number or drawing number, however you identify each of your components. Any drawings should be referenced or contained in the DMR. Uh, some firms have inspection drawings instead of inspection procedures, for example. Component drawings. Are, are very popular as well. Any manufacturing and quality assurance procedures. Some firms have one procedure that they use for both things. I've seen that once or twice. Most firms, though, have one MP, a manufacturing procedure, and a QP for quality assurance, or an IP for an inspection procedure. And those documents should be referenced on the DMR as well in the list. Any fixtures that are used. This is something that's often overlooked as uh, as inclusion in the DMR, but a fixture you use is something that is used to manufacture. You can't manufacture this part per its current process without this particular fixture. And in many cases, many of us, many of our fixtures have drawings themselves, so we identify them that way. Packaging procedure is another example. What your packaging configuration is will have already been uh, spoken to, but what the packaging procedure is, how you seal your pouches, or how you take your uh, large instrument and package it for shipping. That's something that should be included in the DMR as well. Continuing the list of documents in the DMR, the next one is the labeling procedure, how you apply labeling, or some firms have a direct print to pouch machine. Sterilization procedure, what are your sterilization parameters? Or those of us who have our parameters built into, let's call it ST01, our sterilization procedure, I would list ST01 on my DMR. Uh, 
any post-sterilization inspection and testing, including product release. If your product comes back and you don't perform any functional testing, but you perform a visual inspection of the pouch and then you do a document release to release the product, those things should be explained, contained on your DMR, and that's going to be a procedure. And then your shipping procedure. Many of us don't necessarily have shipping procedures per se. If you don't, then obviously you do not need to include it in your DMR. But if it's a procedure that you use to ship product and you restrict yourself in that manner, that's something that needs to be included on your DMR. Looking at device history records now, we had the DMR, and that was the, the recipe, the shopping list. The, the DMR was how you make the product, including all the tools and things that are used. The DHR is, is evidence that shows that you, met, that you did things according to the DMR. The definition says that it contains the production history of the finished device because it is the production record for the device. So you want to make sure that anything you do on that particular lot or unit is contained in your DHR. Any records generated during production, testing, for example, if you do some sort of quality assurance, excuse me, in process or finished device test. If you have any rework that's done during the assembly, that's got to be included here too. When you perform rework, make sure your re rework procedure, excuse me, rework procedure, explicitly includes a documented accounting for confirmation that the rework did not adversely affect the device. That's something that I've learned the hard way, and I hope, you, know, hope uh, you all don't have to learn it the same way as well. Uh, inspection, uh, it's a visual inspection as opposed to an actual test itself, and acceptance from manufacturer. So once these parts are <laughs> issued to production, which begins the manufacturing process, to their distribution, to when they're put into stock, that entire process is going to be captured in your DHR. The regulation requires us to here's you, establish and maintain. So I have a procedure that I've got to have and I've got to update it to ensure that my records, so batch, lot, or unit, that's everything, demonstrate that my device is manufactured in accordance with the DMR. Well, that's a very interesting concept because those of us who have routers, I'll call it, which is the steps that are printed out by your MRP or ERP software that show the steps that your, pro, your, uh, your parts will go through to, to become a finished device. Many of our routers or travelers, whatever you call them, <laughs> say things like step 10, assemble, step 20, inspect, step 30, send to sterilization, step 40, inspect, step 50, receive. Well, that information is up. And of course, people will uh, sign or initial next to each one, and they'll include the quantities of each that made it through each step. But that document omits one very important part of this actual slide. That document itself in no way demonstrates that the device is manufactured in accordance with the DMR. Nowhere on that device did it say, assemble per manufacturing procedure 100, and send to sterilization per STO1. Remember my example from earlier. You've got to make sure that all of your travelers, or whatever you call them, contain sufficient reference to the DMR so that when an individual in assembly or production signs those documents, they are signing that document and it's clear what it is that they've done. So the DHR, again, shall include or refer to the location of the dates of manufacture and the quantity manufactured and the quantity released for distribution. Remember that you could manufacture fewer parts that are released for distribution or more parts if you perform a destructive uh, verification test with each lot, you're going to manufacture more parts than you distribute. Acceptance records that show that you made your device per the DMR. Again, you've got to make sure that you reference documents. Inspect with my inspector's initials is insufficient. It's got to say inspect per QC drawing uh, 100-231, for example. Also in your DHR has to be the label and labeling that's used for each unit. You have a choice here, and I've seen it done probably 50-50 both ways. I've seen companies that print out one extra label, a sticker label, I'll call it, and they put it on a piece of paper, and 
they have someone from production sign that that's what was, that's an ex a sample of what was put on their uh, pouches, for example, and then have someone from Quality Assurance sign that they reviewed that product, and this is a representation of the label that was on that product. Make sure that if you do sterile consumables and you have labeling for the pouch, the chipboard carton, and the shipping box, that a sample of each of those labels appears in the DHR. Similarly, any labels or labeling, so any stickers or IFUs, those of us who make instruments, we have IFUs, instructions for use, or DFUs, whatever we call them, and those are going to be included, they're going to be shipped with each unit much of the time. I've got to either have an example of that label or I can have an inspection record of those labels. So instead of having the exact sticker, or in the worst case scenario, uh, a copy of the 30-page operator's manual, I can merely have an inspection record that states that uh, port number 123, the 30-page oper uh, um, operator's manual, was inspected by this person on this date. It was this rev, and there's how many I inspect, and here's how many I passed or, or failed. Also, the device control numbers, if applicable, should be in the DHR. If you lot number your finished device or you serial number your finished device, that's got to be contained in your DHR. Your DHR has to speak to a specific unit or lot of units. The content should have the part number, the work order number and quantity, the operation sequence performed, and the initials or the signature of the employees who perform each operation. Many of us have uh, many of us who do sterile consumables will have make thousands and thousands on each shift. It's okay to have multiple signatures in or near one particular blank. If you subcontract any operations, if you send something up for milling or machining or molding or overmolding, that's got to be recorded on your DHR as well. Any rework orders or rework information, including the lack, uh, just a rationale for lack of adverse effect of the finished device, should also be included in your DHR. Any nonconformances or some sort of negative type of documentation, I'll call it, should also be included in your DHR. It's, in, it's okay to reference your nonconformance report. If you have NCMR number 168, it's okay just to reference that number in the DHR. If, the, if an inspector or someone performing an a investigation wants to see that document, they'll have to go find that, but it's okay to do that. Lot number or serial number is appropriate. I just mentioned that. Any relevant dates, the date the work order was completed, the date the components were issued, all that information, anytime anyone does a thing, that's got to be dated. Any text and, test and inspection results, and make sure that the test and inspection results do uh, enable a conclusion that the product passed. The initials of the QA inspector, it doesn't necessarily have to be a QA inspector who accepts the work order, who releases the product because they've reviewed all the documentation, they've determined that that documentation is acceptable. That person needs to sign or initial somewhere in the DHR. And the shipping record is a good thing to include in the DHR because then you know where it went. Of all these things, the shipping record is the one I see least commonly but it's a good idea to have it because then you know if you, God forbid, you have to do some kind of recall, you know exactly where the product went. Or if you receive complaints, you know what units or serial numbers the customer or themselves received. From a manufacturer's perspective, I like to think that the DHR enables me to evaluate my product. It gives me traceability and tracking in case of emergencies such as recalls or market corrections. It enables me to trend my quality data because I have a DHR, I know everything that was put into a particular component, and in many cases, if I lot track something, I have that information as well. The DHR lets also lets me do a historical evaluation of changes in the process, you know, the last time I made this lot number of this particular design, or variances. If I have deviations, the deviation itself will live with the DHR. So I can see what the variances are that have been implemented or put in place, either proactively or reactively. And it also facilitates the investigations, corrective actions, other important things like that. From an agency perspective, 
it just shows we're doing what we say we're supposed to be doing. The FDA, when they look at your DHRs and they look good, they will enable they'll that will enable them to conclude that your firm operates in an overall state of control, which is a good phrase. Anytime you can hear the FDA inspector use that phrase, you're doing a great job. Also, when it comes to investigations and corrective and preventive actions, the agency is going to want to see that you perform these things and conclusions that you can draw that are supported by the DHR are the most valid of all. And it ensures labeling control. It, ensure, it shows the agency that I have printed out or referenced every label or labeling inside the, in this lot and that all those labels and labeling are in my change control process. There are a couple of other DHR requirements that I do want to cover kind of briefly. In 82065 traceability, you're required to, if you have an implant or a life sustaining device, you've got to document the control numbers in the DHR. 82080, when it talks about receiving and acceptance, it requires us to have our acceptance activities be part of the DHR. When it comes to non-conforming product, 82090 says that anytime we rework and reevaluate product, including, here we go, so now it's even in the regulation, including a determination of any adverse effect from the rework upon the product, that's got to be in the DHR. And as we've said earlier, labeling, label release has to be documented. Um, each of the labels and labeling has to be documented in the DHR as well. And generally speaking, DHRs have to be reasonably accessible to the manufacturer and the FDA, and they've got to be readily available and legible. The whole concept of reasonableness is just a logical thing. When the FDA comes, if they don't call in advance, if they do call in advance, you can contact your off-site storage facility if you use one and say, what kind of notice do we need to give you? Usually it's 24 to 48 hours, and that's, in my experience, considered to be reasonably accessible. When it comes to legibility, there are people who, let's just say, get kind of creative with their signatures. You want to make sure that people understand that their signatures, while cool when they sign like that, have to be legible for a regulatory reason. You've got to be able to identify the person by initials and by signature. I know of firms in which document control maintains a signature and initial book, so they know that that incredibly illegible scribble is Ron Smith, for example. So that's an idea when it comes to legibility. How long you keep the DHR? Either two years from the date of release or the expected life of the device, whichever is uh, longer. So if you have a product that it has a three-year shelf life, you've got to keep it for three years. If you have a product with a one-year shelf life, you've got to keep it for two years. Technical file is the international version of the DHF, and it, show how you, it shows how you comply with the essential requirements as set forth in the medical device directive, and it applies to three of the four classifications of devices. Class three, the most restrictive devices, don't require a technical file. They re require what's called a design dossier. The, only, the contents are the same. The only difference is that you can keep your tech files on site for review by the notified body, but your Class three devices that have design dossiers, those dossiers have to be submitted for review before you can CE mark your device. The structure of the tech file begins with the introduction, then the ER checklist itself continues on with the risk analysis. And you can see here as we go on that while some of this has very similar, if not identical, information to the DHF, there is a lot more to this. Something like a section for the risk analysis and your ER checklist, well, that's an international concept. Um, a, a little more than the, than the uh, domestic requirements. Section five is all of your testing that went on in support of your product. Six is your clinical data. Seven begins, you know, seven and eight begin the internal documentation. So what kind of packaging qualification did you do? That's obviously very important. Shelf life testing that you've done, accelerated and or real time. Labelings, the IFUs, as well as your advertising materials have to both be included in your technical file. You're gonna to have to change control these as well under your ECO or 
document control procedure. Any manufacturing information is Section 9. Sterilization is its own section because many of us don't perform sterilization or don't contract out sterilization. If you subcontract out sterilization, you're going to have to include that information, who your sterilizer is, for example, in your tech file. And Section 11 is the Declaration of Conformity. I'm going to cover each of these sections in just a little more detail to finish out this webinar. The introduction has a bit of information in it. It's all textual, and it's not really, I, I don't want to call it, it's not, it's not really technical. That's the, let me use that terminology. It begins with the product, product description and then the, speci the specifics for use. And here's the list of those, uh, how they use. Remember that some of this is a bit labeling related. So for example, the indications uh, and the contraindications and the warnings all are taken exactly from your labeling. Make sure that in your instructions for use, you uh, have the same exact wording as you do here in your tech file. What kind of accessories go with the product? Many of us sell or offer accessories, for example, a, something like a cable that goes with our finished device. It has a part number, but they're not lock controlled and they're not sold on their own specifically for medical applications. Obviously, you need one to use your system in many cases. So in that case, that accessory just needs to be listed and described, uh, listed and described here in this section of the tech file. Any regulatory approvals that you have at this point, you're going to want to list them here. Uh, what your device classification is according to Annex 9 of the directive. Annex 9 walks you through. It's not a flow chart per se, but it's sort of a question list, and it walks you through and enables you to conclude what your classification is. And what conformity assessment route you chose has to also finish out the uh, introduction section. The ER checklist is used to show compliance to each and every aspect of the medical device directive. It's a 16 or some odd page, or, uh, usually it's an Excel spreadsheet, excuse me. I've given you a sample here. Uh, there are many others throughout the internet for you to look at, but this is one that I've used in the past. And it's a large, again, it's a quite a, it's, it's not something that will take you a short amount of time to pull together. When you perform your risk assessment, your risk analysis, make sure that you do so per ISO 14971 and that you do so per ISO 14971, the newest version. There's a 2012 version that's, that was uh, implemented pretty recently. Um, before that, I believe there was a 2008 or 09. So it, it's updated quite frequently, more so than things like the QSR or the Medical Device Directive uh, or the ISO standards themselves. You've got to have post-market surveillance, which is just a fancy way of saying complaint history, and clinic, clinical experience and clinical risks. It's okay to have clinical experience be your complaint history. That is, a, that is clinical feedback. Some firms choose to go over and above, like they'll have the uh, customer questionnaires that are sent out, and those are, those are equally valid. Clinical risks you can get from your risk asset, from your uh, from the documentation that you prepared earlier when you've tried to mitigate your design input risks. So you've already prepared that domestically, and now you just need to include it in this international document. Section four of the TF is any sort of uh, drawings and design of product specifications. So you're going to describe the product, you're going to list the components and materials. Photographs are not required but when I submit my tech files to my notified body, they're very, very useful. I often get compliments on how easy it was to understand the product with these photos. A brief description of any design control practices that you utilize. It's okay to say that you're in compliance with uh, ISO 1345, the appropriate section of that, as well as uh, a 20.20, I believe, which is design control. Any verifications or validations should be, as we've said throughout, included or referenced here. Uh, it's okay to reference them by number because these are prominent documents, and in many cases they are very large prominent documents. Any sort of quality system certificates that your company has should be included in this section of the tech file. And what is your final product release criteria? 
those of us who sell more simple devices have merely just a documentation review. Others, it's a little more advanced. So whatever your criteria is, you want to include it at this point. I'm not going to spend too much time on, <clears throat> excuse me, on Section 5 other than to say that this is the testing. So Section 5.1 talks about your bench testing. And what it requires you to do is document a protocol, which is a test plan, and these are the contents that have to be uh, within the test protocol. Among the most prominent that, in my experience, some firms forget from time to time is acceptance criteria, which is what the product, how the product has to perform, and also calibration information. Sometimes we tend, we uh, sometimes we overlook the need to have the calibration information and requirements and schedule in the testing protocol and what products you're going to use and how many and what testing you're performing prior to testing. Many times we will perform some accelerated aging testing before we begin our validation documents and what those conditions were if you do accelerated aging. Once the protocol is done, you're going to have a test report. And that test report has to include, obviously, the raw data and the statistical analysis. Very important is an interpretation of the data. Going back to talking about engineers, in my experience, engineers almost always fulfill their requirements for delivering uh, test data, test results. But they don't interpret things. I encourage my engineers to write something to a sixth grader in their data interpretation and conclusions. You'd be surprised after they're finished laughing, of course, how easily understandable that uh, that interpretation is from a in, from internal audit perspective to a notified body, and most importantly, to an FDA inspection. It's, FDA inspectors like it a lot when they don't have to sift through the raw data and statistics and can get to conclusions that, for, about which they can sample the data. Sometimes, though, during our test reports, we'll, we'll make a mistake. Maybe I'm testing pull strength of an assembly, but the product was misassembled. The, the wrong glue was used. Well, I'm going to include a deviation from the protocol in that, and I'm going to include a justification, which might say something like, well, one part was misassembled, so it was, it's not that it failed the validation report. It was that it was NA almost. So I made another product, and I made it according to the procedures set forth in, this, in the protocol, and then here's the product. Just like the protocol, the results document will have approval signatures. You want them to have people in advance approve what you're going to do, and then you want them to improve, approve excuse me, the actual data itself. Section 5.2 speaks to biocompatibility testing. And just spend a minute here speaking to the fact that you've got to include the categorization of your device. What, based on nature and duration of body contact, and conclude what testing is required per the ISO standard. This is the same ISO standard that is used for uh, submissions, for 510K submissions. So it's very consistent throughout its application and use. What testing was performed, and you make sure when you get these test reports that they contain certain things. Many of us don't perform our own biocompatibility tests, but we want to make sure that we select good firms that do so, good contractors, and that in the reports themselves, it has the test lab accreditation, a good description of the test sample. That's going to come from your firm when you fill out the test request form. So make sure you're as wordy as you need to be. What test procedure was performed uh, when it comes to biocompatibility bi testing, there are standards. 10993 has multiple standards. You want to make sure that the testing performed, their test results reference that standard and any subsections it needs to. And obviously in bright, bright green letters or whatever color, the test result. 5.3 and 5.4 speak to microbiology and coding of devices. I'm not going to say anything about these other than to say that please note when it comes to microbiological safety and tissues of animal origin, there are specific standards that I've cited here in the presentation that you can look at to get additional information if you fall in the niche market of any of these devices. Clinical data is very interesting because it applies in particular 
to implantable devices and Class III devices. It doesn't apply exclusively to those. It applies in particular to those. So the way I've done it in the past is I've based my clinical data on either a compilation of scientific literature. If you're in a larger industry, there's going to be scientific literature that talks about uh, the use of your the purpose and use of your device, but if you're not, you're get, you're going to have to rely base your clinical data on the results of the clinical investigations conducted. Notice it doesn't say clinical trials; it says clinical investigations. I've seen interpretations approved by notified bodies interpreting clinical study as historical complaint data. So that's something that you can use. That's a good. I would say if you can't find any scientific literature or actual clinical trials themselves, you should feel free to go with the complaint history as your clinical results of clinical investigations. That's your historical data. Clinical studies are required really pretty much across the board. So brand new devices, modified devices that may significantly affect safety or, or performance, an existing device that has a new indication, a device that is made using a body contact material that is either new or modified, and any time you want to extend the use life of your device, you've got to perform clinical studies that support that. Section 7 is the packaging qualification and shelf life. And there are three standards that you can choose from, and it's up to your firm whether you want to choose to do real-time or accelerated or both. Many firms will do their accelerated aging testing, and when they pull their samples for that, they're going to pull two times the amount of samples. They'll use one X of those for the accelerated aging, and they'll use the other half. They'll just put it on the shelf and they'll let it sit there for two or three years, depending on what their, what their um, <coughs> shelf life is. Remember, though, that you've got to do two types of tests. You have to test shelf life, which is usually a sterility test. But you also have to test performance. You want to be able to know, you need to be able to know, that your device still works after its ex, you know, right before its expiration date concludes. What some firms choose to do is, if they have a three-year shelf life, they will accelerate it age to four years to assure, I'm sorry, accelerate it in real-time age for four years to make sure that they can meet that. For sterile devices, some of the documents you've got to have are the packaging and packaging materials, including specifically whether it's Tyvek or paper, what the film is made out of, information such as that. Your process validation for your packaging and or sealing procedure, many of us seal using a sealing machine. Any sort of packaging integrity test, visually or a dye penetrant or a seal or pull seal strength, either of those are acceptable. Labeling integrity, how do you know that your label is legible, and if you use a sticky label as opposed to a direct print pouch, how do you know that it's adhered? And any sort of accelerated aging studies are included in, <laughs> excuse me, in this section as well. Section eight is all about the labeling and all about the advertising material. All of your labels, all of your IFUs, you've got to make sure, just as an informational thing here, that the symbology you use on your labels, on your IFUs, and even on your advertising and promotional materials and your website are in compliance with EN 980 or 15223. It's okay to use one language on your material. Don't get too hooked up on the concept of national languages because it, some countries do allow English as an official language. Others do not. In those that do not, you've got to make sure that you use their native language on the packaging, on the devices that are sent to them. Advertising and promotional materials should be in section eight of the tech file as well. And so should a link to or mention of your website. That is certainly considered advertising material. Section nine is manufacturing. Uh, Flowchart is a great way to start this because it sets, it shows in a good snapshot the entire process. When it comes to manufacturing conditions, if you use either of 14644 or 14698, then you've got to make sure you reference them. If you reference a standard here and generally speaking, make sure you can demonstrate compliance to that. 
the quality system cert for the manufacturing plant, a copy of that should go in here, as well as what type of labeling control you use, uh, what your traceability requirements are, uh, any sort of in, uh, product or envi and or environmental buyer burden requirements that you have, how frequently you measure them, things like that. If you sell a blood contact device, you're going to want to include pyrogen testing in this section, and you want to reference preventive monitoring of processes, for example, statistical process control here in the manufacturing section. Sterilization, again, very product specific. You've got to comply with 550 and 11130. Uh, this section of the tech file should reference the location of the annual sterilization validation reports. Those, each one of those is one or two, if not larger, gigantic binders, a good, looking at one now, a good two to three inches, if not larger. Those are kind of large. So it's okay to reference them to say that in the Director of Quality's office, that's where we maintain the annual sterilization validation reports. And then someone will come here and we'll take a look at them. Um, 11.135 requires revalidation at defined intervals, and it also requires that those intervals be justified. The reason I like to include that in this presentation is, I guess I can't see any of you, is if I were to call, if I were to uh, ask for a show of hands for those of us who are in consumables, but also do an annual sterilization revalidation, I think most of our hands would go up. To date, I've been able to locate something in any regulation that explicitly requires the performance of annual re-sterilization validation. Having said that, I don't know a firm that doesn't do it. And you want to make sure that your sterilization plant is certified by a notified body, at least to those two standards, if not more. The declaration of conformity, as opposed to me giving you even something like something as straightforward as recommended formats, there are so many formats that I can't possibly explain it to you. If you type declaration of conformity either in this uh, in this site that I'm listing here or in Google <coughs> Images, you will find dozens and dozens of declarations of conformity that will work for your purposes. There's no set format, but there is a set type of requirements. So use something else that's out there. So to summarize, the DHF is a product line specific history of the design process from the uh, concept phase all the, way th all the way through the design transfer phase. All of that is included in your DHF. The DMR, just make sure that your devices are made the way they're supposed to be made. And if your DHF has a section of deliverables, one, one document of which was uh, submission of an ECO for a particular DMR, that's going to be in there, and that's how you can verify that. Remember again to include something in your DHR moving forward here that demonstrates that you make your devices in accordance with the DMR. Make sure you reference procedure numbers, not REVs, procedure numbers and things like that. And last, the technical file is a document that does have a bit of crossover with the DHF, does have some sections that are not so much crossover, but its purpose is to illustrate your company's compliance and that device's compliance, that is, with the ERs in, their, in the uh, international regulations. So that's the end of the presentation. I guess we can begin to take questions now. Thank you so much, Mr. Castle, for the wonderful presentation, and also all our participants for cooperating with us. It's time now for the Q&A to begin, and we request all who have questions uh, for our presenter to click on the raise hand option, which is a palm-like icon at the bottom of your participants panel. Uh, you can also go ahead and paste your questions on the Q&A panel so that our presenter can read it out loud and then answer them. If for any reason you are unable to ask your questions using either of these two means, uh, please share it with me, your host, by chat, and I shall pass it on to the presenter to answer it. Now, uh, in the meanwhile, we sincerely request you to share your feedback in the feedback form that will appear on your screen in the polling panel right now. Uh, the feedback form has about seven questions, mostly multiple choice in nature, and wouldn't take more than two minutes of time to answer. The polling will remain open till the end of the session, and you can answer it even after the Q&A is done. 
uh, now that we uh, have our Q&A session open. Um, participants who do have uh, questions, please click on the raise hand icon, which is uh, at the bottom of your participants panel. And I can unmute your lines, and you can ask your questions directly. Well, while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I just wanted to go ahead and take you through a couple of slides uh, of the upcoming webinars from Mr. Kassoff. Uh, we have one um, in later this month on April 23rd and in, on July 24th, the other one. I uh, also wanted to inform all of uh, our participants that in case your team members, colleagues, friends might benefit from this webinar, we are happy to inform you that it would be available in a recorded format and can be purchased from our website or you can call us at 1-800-447-9407. OK, uh, I think we do have one question coming. Uh, let me quickly go ahead and. Jennifer, can you hear me? Yes, I can. OK. A best demonstrated practice where we can go to and look at a, a DMR. Uh, I, I'm sorry. Um, if, if you could repeat the question once again. Yes, concerning the device master record, is there a place where we could look at a best demonstrated practice? Uh, to see to a picture of what this looks like, an example of what uh, what you would consider to be a great example of a DMR. Wow, that's a good question. Um, Trying to think of the best way to handle this. Let's let's do this. Why don't if and, and I hate to ask you to do this. Why don't you submit that question via email to the folks at uh, compliance panel? They'll forward it to me, and I'll respond with an example. Okay, that'd be Does that great. work. OK, great. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much. I'll, I'll follow up with that question, Mr. Kessel. OK, great. Thanks so much. Well, uh, I don't see any more questions coming up. Uh, I also want to inform uh, all our participants that in case you do have any more questions uh, that might arise, uh, please feel free to email it to us at uh, Global Compliance Panel, uh, which is webinars at globalcompliancepanel.com, or you feel free to go ahead and send it out to, uh, to me, that is johnson at globalcompliancepanel.com and then uh, I can pass it on to our uh, presenter to get an answer. OK, uh, we do have one more question, Mr. Kassoff, just going ahead and unmuting the line. Mr. Hansen, go ahead. Yeah, just one quick question. You, you talked about how um, DHFs are a living document and, and kind of skimmed over a little bit how you'd revise those more in, of the, the post-production state. So you have feedback coming in, customer complaints, you'd update your inputs. Can you kind of expand on that a little bit more? Sure. Um, uh, uh, an example of a way to do that might be to fold, once your design input documentation, once you've released your product, you have frozen temporarily, that is, your input documents at whatever particular date rev that they're, that they're at. Perhaps that you've already modified your input documentation, let's say twice during development, so now it's at rev 2. When you eat once, when you decide that you're going to ahead and modify that, you might consider folding your input documentation into your ECO process and uh, initiating an ECO or ECN, what have you, for that input documentation, and then changing that so that your tech file has the current, all the previous, but as well as the current input documents. So that's the way that I've seen it done. That seems to take advantage of existing processes that are already implemented. Okay, oh, is, that, is that clear up? Okay, welcome. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, Ms. Kassoff. Uh, there's one more question. Uh, Craig, uh, could you go ahead? Yes, I just had a question uh, with regard to um, <clears throat> the actual FDA, US FDA requirements. I'm assuming that, um, you know, per the seminar, that the primary files mentioned here, uh, those four primary files, 
DHF, DMR, DHR, and technical file, are those all required by the US FDA and to be titled as such? No, the technical file is an international uh, ISO medical device directive related document. But the other three are the DHF, the DMR, and the DHR are all uh, required to be maintained per the, per the QSR regs. Okay, so, you know, we have um, kind of some different documentation. Because we produce identical devices um, for industrial applications, uh, we tend to have, we carry dual certification for our quality systems, but these, we don't necessarily have each one of those, a design history file, a design master record, um, and a design history record specifically related to the proprietary names we're selling. Do you understand what I'm driving at here? I think um, you, ha you, have the con you have the contents, but you don't have the titles. You're meeting the requirements, correct. but they're titled differently. Just Correct. prepare some sort of policy document for your company and, you know, for the FDA when they come to visit, of course, that, you know, uh, you know, a change control document that says, look, here's what we call it, but this meets the requirements of the device master record per the GMP or for the QSR requirements. So just prepare a, what I'll call a tier one document that you, implement, you have in your process that explains that and then you're covered. Okay, I, I understand what you're saying. Now, okay. with regards to the requirements under each one of the, the contents, if you would, of those files, uh, you mentioned at times some were optional and some were ideal, some were recommended. Um, right. We, and then I'm also going to assume that, uh, you know, I made note of that. So I'm saying that the contents are not necessarily specific US FDA requirements, but that they're kind of a, re a recommended overall. Like, can you expand on that? Sure, I can. Um, in the, the best way to do that would be to take a look at in the in the regulations. Uh, eight twenty point one eighty one is the device master record, and eight twenty point one eighty four is the device history record. If you take a look at those sections, they're not very large at all. They will set forth the exact minimum requirements, and that would be the easiest okay. way for you to assure that you're meeting just that. So you said uh, A20, 181, and 184? That's uh, correct. Device master record and de device history record, respectively. Yes. yes. Okay. All right. Um, kind of my last question on the, the content of the technical files, um, or excuse me, the contact, the content of those specific four files we mentioned. I'm assuming that those are also um, Device-specific, in other words, uh, uh, class, of, class of the device and, for instance, um, the majority of the devices we produce are class one, non-sterile, non-measuring. Okay. So the expense of those records, a lot of that is it could be listed as not applicable. That is correct. Okay, so in those, in those cases, is it best to leave, say, the format or, or the place mark and say yeah. that our products are non-sterile? Uh, you Absolutely. know, non-measuring. Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, you you need to make sure you have placeholders, as you said, for each of the sections. Just write not applicable, but also explain why it's not applicable. Don't just write NA, right? Not applicable. This is what our device does. It's clearly not a measuring device, for example. Okay. I understand. Okay. Thanks for your input, too. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Kasoff. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we are actually running out of time and must end our webinar session. As I mentioned earlier, in case you do have any further questions, please feel free to share it with me by chat, or you can also email it to me at johnson.a at globalcompliancepanel.com. And I shall get the answer from our presenter and send it out to you by email at the earliest. Uh, we are grateful to all of you for having taken part in this webinar, and I would like to if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can send us an email at webinars at globalcompliancepanel.com. We welcome your suggestions and feedbacks or ideas on how we can improve our webinars. If you'd like to suggest a topic or desire a customized corporate training online or on site, we ensure that whatever your training necessity is, it would be our priority. We look forward to having you with us again sometime soon and for your continued patronage on behalf of our presenter, Mr. Jeff Kassoff and the Global Compliance Panel team. I would like to say thank you for participating in today's webinar. 
and we wish you a pleasant day ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff. I shall follow up with you on.